Good morning. How about another round of applause for the praise band? That was awesome. I, I, I love coming and listening to them every week and, you know, attempting to sing along. Uh, so I'm Ryan Churchmom, I'm one of the elders here at uh, Christ Church. I just have a few announcements to make this morning. Uh, first, you have a connection card in, in front of you, on the, on the chair in front of you. Um, fill that out if you, it, you know, if you have any prayer requests. Uh, if you're a first-time visitor, let us know you're here. We have a gift for you out at our Welcome Center. Uh, also, if, if you've never been here before, if you're a first-time guest, you may wonder why we do things a little differently. You know, we don't have this gigantic pulpit up here. Um, you know, Trent's not wearing a robe. Well, we, we felt like he wasn't real engaged towards the end of his messages. We couldn't figure out why. So, you know, maybe he had a tea time or something. <laughs> so anyway, we got rid of the pulpit. It, it, his messages seem to be a little bit better now. Um, Next thing is uh, Operation Christmas Child. Uh, all of the boxes have been picked up, and we thank uh, everybody for doing that. Um, but you can still get a brochure uh, out at the Welcome Center. Use a shoe box if you would still like to participate in that. We'll take as many boxes as we can and, and try and uh, bless a child uh, as best we can. And uh, last thing, November 30th is going to be Christmas Decorations Day. Uh, time is still to be determined. We don't have a time on that, but if you would like to, to be part of that, come and decorate uh, the sanctuary with, uh, with Christmas decorations. Just fill out the connection card, drop it off in, in one of the offering boxes, and uh, someone will be in contact with you. And that's all I have. Thanks. Ryan, thanks. I don't think that first announcement was approved. <laughs> Just kidding. Hey, Renee. Uh, question for you or a thought. I preach regularly and often all control, all control belongs to God. And I was thinking about some things over this last week or two, except one thing. There's one thing God, it's not that he doesn't control it. I'm not sure. I think it would because he's not a bully. He can't control it because he gave us freedom of choice. All control belongs to God except our attitude. We have the choice every day to determine the kind of attitude that we carry into all or any circumstance of any kind. And I want to talk about today having an attitude of gratitude. We have so many things to be thankful for. Stand with me. Here's the teaching of Jesus uh, that we're using as the foundation for this message this morning. Luke 17, it's recorded, now on his way to Jerusalem... Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee, and as he was going into a village, ten men, ten, who had leprosy met him. It says, they stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, go. That's probably what I'd have said as well, go. <laughs> but there's a great story of another leper that we're not going to cover today that just fascinating that we'll pause in a minute right now. When the leper came and asked to be healed, again, if I were Jesus, I would have said, go. But Jesus, before he said a word, touched him. Unbelievable, touched him. That guy hadn't felt touch for who knows how long. Leprosy is a death sentence. A death sentence of loneliness and disease and body parts literally degrading and falling off before your very eyes. They stood at a distance, called out, Jesus, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, it says they were cleansed. Didn't happen right on the spot. As they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, one of them out of ten came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Important Luke put that in there. And Jesus asked him, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, in the next few moments, help us make a deliberate decision to be grateful, to have an attitude of gratitude. 
Thank you for how you have provided. Thank you for the unbelievable blessings. Whether we're going through good or bad times in life, the unbelievable blessings all around us in our lives. And I pray that after today that we would have a laser focus and be even more grateful than we've ever been. You are such a great God. Thank you for a beautiful morning. Thank you for an opportunity for us as your church to gather inside these walls. May we be better because of our time with you, and may you be honored above all. Jesus, it's in your name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated, please. Jesus says to these lepers, go and show yourselves to the priests. They look down at their bodies. The hands of one man is still mangled. I'm wondering if they had maybe some doubts for a moment. Maybe they'd heard the story that just at the word of Jesus, people were healed, the dead are raised, the deaf hear, the blind see. I wonder what went through their minds as they looked down at their bodies. After hearing Jesus say, go, you are healed, they still see a mangled leg. Maybe it just at the ending is a diseased, filthy rag holding it off. Another looks at his skin and he finds it's as repulsive as ever. In other words, all of these men, 10 of them, were no better off than they had been just like 10 minutes earlier when they had first spotted this famous rabbi, this teacher, this healer, this miracle worker, Jesus. It's fascinating if we pull up, let me just pull up some Levitical law out of the old book of Leviticus back in what I call the Jewish part of the Bible, which is the Old Covenant. It's our roots. It's the beginning of it. It's all completed right now. I look at the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant is like a puzzle. They're both puzzles, if you will. And the Old Testament, the Old Covenant is like a completed puzzle. It's been, it's been lacquered. It's hanging on the wall. And we have such deep appreciation, great learning, hard work, the beginnings. We really appreciate that. But what puzzle gets the attention? The one that's unfinished. That's where we put our attention today in the New Covenant. Let's go back and just listen to some crazy things back into the Old Covenant that God uh, asked or commanded of the Israelites to do. And a lot of people get frustrated. In fact, you'll come across uh, people who don't believe or maybe they believe in God, but they're angry about whatever. And, and they'll, they'll, if you ever were to ask them, have you ever read the Bible? Oh, yeah, yeah. That Old Testament with all that Bible that has all those old rules, those crazy things about this and this and this. Well, you got to remember a lot of these laws I think God had the foresight to know that when they're wandering through the desert for 40 years, this would have been to save the entire Israel nation. They're wandering in the desert for 40 years. If even an infectious disease had gotten started amongst the million plus, some say upwards to five or six million, could have been wandering through the desert together. Any kind of disease would have wiped them out. So a lot of those old, my opinion, a lot of those old covenant laws were about health and medical issues to save the people physically. And so here's some of them. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses, Leviticus 13, and to Aaron, when a person has a swelling, a scab, or a spot on the skin of his body, and it becomes a disease on the skin of his body, he's to be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons, the priest. Jesus says, go and see the priests. You got to remember when we just read, when we read that of the 10 lepers, Jesus has not died on the cross yet. He has not risen from the dead. The old covenant law is still in effect. And he says, go and see the priest. So you got to go to the priest. The priest will examine the infection on the skin of his body. And if, if the hair in the infection is turned white and the effect, infection appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it's a skin disease. The priest examined him, must pronounce him unclean. But if the spot on the skin of the body is white and does not appear to be deeper than the skin and the hair in it is not turned white, the priest must quarantine the infected person for seven days. It goes on and on and on, and you can read all kinds of uh, things as I'm, I'm just scanning through this. It goes on for a long chapter. When a boil appears on the skin, skin this is gross stuff. A priest had, <coughs> excuse me, a priest had, he had weird roles. He was like a butcher, a doctor, a pastor, a prayer. He had a lot of things that he had to do back in these days. When the priest examines, there's no white hair on it, it goes on when, when there's a burn on the skin. On the skin, man, I might need a bottle of water here in a minute. Uh, produced by fire, the patch made raw by the burn. Da, 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 da. There's one in here I really wanted to point out. 
all these crazy rules. I just wanted to really be crystal clear with you about a very serious issue. Where is it? Ah, here it is. Leviticus, Leviticus 13, verse 40. If a man loses the hair on his head and he is bald, he is still clean. Yeah. Just wanted to be clear. Couldn't help it. And so here they are. They've been told, go to the priest. Jesus was still about honoring the old covenant law. He was amazing that way. Total, total integrity. And so they headed off. Even though on the spot they didn't see, give it a toss here, coach. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Oh, man, you guys are like awesome. I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what that was. And so here they are. Jesus says, go, be healed. Still nothing's happening. And yet they head off in search of the priest, and on their way, it says, they were healed. On their way, a hand reappears, literally. It begins to tingle again with life, imagine. A crutch fell to the ground, no longer needed to be used. Leg was back, healthy, whole, complete. Skin is cleared. The tiny hairs on the forearm turned from white as snow to golden brown. They all became tall, dark, and handsome once again. They looked at each other, and the celebration screaming started. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but come on. They raced off into the distant, jubilant, excited, unbelievable. Their death sentence has been completely healed and restored. But in order for this miracle to happen, these men had to do something. They had to start walking. They had to start walking in faith before their circumstances had changed even one tiny bit. I wonder if it was a test by Jesus. The Bible tells us God will never tempt us, but He will test us. Is there really a more focused lesson for any single one of us on this day, you, you and I, we cannot wait until the problems that we're facing are over to start walking in faith. If it's an attitude of gratitude today, we would do well that even in the rough times, you can read through the New Covenant Scriptures talking about consider it pure joy when you go through trials and tribulations, for it builds all kinds of great character traits in our lives and spiritual fruit in our lives. But here's the deal, you and I cannot put conditions on the Creator, on a holy God. You and I cannot say, Lord, as soon as there's enough money, I'll follow your instructions. You cannot pray, Lord, if you'll just solve this issue in my family, in my personal life, I will then start to go to church. You and I cannot put the conditions on God. Instead, God places a demand on us, the demand for faith on us before anything at all has ever changed. God might say, love me despite the disease. Obey me despite the lack of talent or the lack of resources. Follow me now despite the depression. Say no to the temptation while it's still difficult. Praise me in the darkest of nights and in the worst of circumstances. God might ask that of us, for this is the very nature of God, a God who loves us, you so much, that He'll give you the opportunity to be thankful when nothing about our circumstances gives us that motivation. That's being a true follower of Christ. That is the very definition of faith at its very best. If you think about it, if you praised God only on the good days, only in the best of circumstances, that's not faith. That's not faith at all. Nine ran off. One returned. Can you understand why? Think with me. I thought about that this week. Imagine a young dad. We've got some young dads in the room with little kids. He's quarantined to death. He sees something on his skin begin to change, and he knows he's got to go to the priest. And the priest says... This is bad. You're quarantined for seven days, no contact. In fact, 
If you come around public, you have to keep at a distance. You should cover your face and declare, unclean, unclean, over and over and over when you're around public. It's a death sentence that you've been given. You go back after seven days and you notice it's getting worse. The priest will eventually tell you, you have leprosy. This is a death sentence. You must be, it's a form of excommunicated. No public contact at all. And so what happens? I love the phrase, birds of a feather flock together. And they found community amongst one another, these, these lepers. Never again allowed to touch their loved ones. A dad separated, these ten, let's say they're all dads, separated from their wives and their children. No hugs, no more holding of your wife. You can't be around your children. You're not even able to provide an income. This week I read a story about Beth Moore. One of her bucket lists was to, uh, in her ministry, was to serve lepers, do any to, to travel somewhere and serve lepers. And so she found the opportunity, and she went, she traveled, she got onto the ground, and as she was ready to enter into the village where to come through the gates and begin to serve and minister and love to the many people in there who are death sentenced to leprosy. She said as she got to the front gate and was ready to push through, they didn't know that she was quite there yet. And she said she began to gag. And she was so overwhelmed by the stench and the smell of dead, rotting flesh that she chose, as she tried to go in a few times, and she just couldn't do it. And she, she, her story, her testimony of it says, as she was about to force herself through, she was so afraid of vomiting in the presence of the lepers, she did not want to humiliate them. So she turned and walked away from her bucket list item. She just couldn't do it. That's how bad it smelled. So imagine the death sentence of a group of lepers who were simply told, go, you are healed. One of them comes back. You've been healed. Where would you run first? You haven't held your kids in who knows how long. Could have been years and years. You haven't been around your wife. You haven't had an ounce of good news. You haven't been able to provide for your family. It's almost a death sentence for the entire family in that culture. Maybe the nine ran home because they just couldn't wait to hold their loved ones. And to share the good news. But one, one took a moment to thank his healer before running home. It's interesting how the one who returned was doubly cursed. Luke records, he didn't say anything about the other nine, but he said the one who, was, who returned to give thanks. He says, oh, and he was also a Samaritan. A Samaritan was somebody that back in the Babylonian exiles in the days when, when conquering armies would come in due to Israel's unfaithfulness, God would allow them to be attacked and to be exiled, captured, taken into foreign countries where they mixed in their marriages in the Jewish culture. That's a death sentence too. You didn't mix your blood according to the Jewish old covenant. You married only Israeli or Jewish people. And when they were forced out and became slaves and were forced into marriage, they became half-bloods, nicknamed amongst the, the Israelite people, basically what we would call today mutts. And they were absolutely hated by anybody who was Gentile or non-Jewish, and they were hated by the Jewish people. They were their own group of people. This leper was doubly cursed as a Samaritan and as a leper. Isn't it fair? Wouldn't you agree with me that you have met some people who have told you their story, their testimony of tragic life, terrible things happening to them, and you're blown away at how joyful they are, how much maturity they have, how much character they have. Why is it in our society we try so hard to make sure we live the safest, most comfortable life possible when it's often the hard times, the difficult times, the discipline in life that builds the character in us? And this guy had had it so bad he made sure to go back and thank his creator, his healer. Had some discussion with some staff about, does that maybe mean that the nine actually didn't get healed? That the nine who didn't go back and thank Jesus, you know, I, I had a grandma, I love her, and, and, but when she gave me gifts, man, if I didn't write her a thank you card, all you know what broke out. 
And I had to like hide the gift because she'd take it back. So I learned to do thank you cards. But I don't think Jesus is that way. I think he's so good that even the nine who didn't thank you, he went ahead and healed them anyway. My opinion. I think he's that good. I think God is that good. And you've got to have a mentality in your head that God is that kind, that patient, that loving, and that good. There are so many religions in our world today that will teach you God's angry and he's mean. And he's looking for a reason for you to mess up just so he can curse you and throw a lightning bolt or whatever. That is not the Lord. It is not the Lord. There is no greater love than the one who lays down his life for a friend. And when he laid down his life, he declared us all friends. So the Samaritan, the doubly cursed one, he must have known or he must have recognized that there is a person, there is a force greater than his own ego, his own pride, his own pain. And that greater force, that greater being, our creator, is always at work and he's always available. Such good news. Gratitude is sacred. Gratitude is sacred. Jesus is sacred. This healed man made sure to do something about that fact, and it was just a simple return, a simple detour, a simple practice of some self-control and discipline to hold off saying even to his family, I'm healed. He ran back and thanked his creator first. His priorities were crystal clear through his action. This man had an attitude of gratitude. Speaking of a simple gratitude, I'd like to pause. If you have served and you are a veteran, this is not Memorial Day weekend. This is Veterans Day. Memorial is where we honor those who have died for the cause of freedom. But this weekend is if you have served in the military and you're considered a veteran. Is there anybody in here? I always wonder. You guys are quiet and sneaky ones. You don't like to be recognized. Sorry, stand your tails up, would you? Yeah. We love you. We love you all for sure. Thanks for being people of gratitude and thanking them and, and all of that. So let's look at three A words. How to grow an attitude of gratitude. These should be easy to remember. Number one, admit there is abundance in life. Admit there's abundance in life. I do a lot of work in Uganda, Africa, in January 10th through the 20th, taking 24 people over to paint a big school that we're finishing up. And I remember one of the first times, it was about the third time I was over there, I chose to take a bunch of Bibles with me and we rallied up about 50 pastors from the villages around and I spent two days just talking with them and encouraging them and talking about church and church strategy as they want to see their churches grow and be healthy as well. And on the second day, all through that first day, I, I, I was just getting to know them. And I started seeing patterns and attitudes, and, and I just didn't notice any attitudes of, they're people of joy, but they're people of desperation. And so I had a question. The next morning, I stepped up, and we met in a classroom. And the way the classroom was, there were some, some steel windows that opened up. Uh, right next door was an old gentleman and his wife who had taken their little strip of land, I, I'd say maybe a third of an acre, maybe a little bigger. And he had, just a, he had a house that was made out of mud brick. It was actually pretty decent, all done and built by himself. And he had a cow right in the back, and he had her fenced in, and she was eating banana leaves, and they were taking milk from her. And right out of that, he had potatoes growing in the ground, and he had a row of avocado trees. Now, avocados in Uganda, they were growing on the equator, not like these little ones we get that are still delish. Row of tomatoes, uh, cassava is a special root that's a cool thing, and banana trees, and mango tree rows. I mean, this farmer, he had chickens in a coop producing eggs, and it just was like his own little ecosystem. And so I asked these pastors, and I had it strategically set up to where they'd be looking out those windows, and I said, how many of you believe that Uganda is a country of abundance? Not one pastor raised his hand. And I stepped back and I said, exhibit A, mango trees, avocado trees, watermelon were growing on there, cantaloupe were growing down there, potatoes, 
cattle, chickens. I said, that's just one farmer over there. How many of you believe he's a man of abundance? They all raised their hand. How many of you know that story? And about half of them did. And they, one of the guys shared a testimony that that guy had nothing. He just started. He just started. And all of the land around them has all of the abundance. But year after year after year, they have been so given and given that they become dependent on that giving. They forget to see how abundant everything is around them. And with some work ethic and strategy and planning, they can be so full of abundance. How about you? You look at your life, you look at your circumstances, you look at an American society and where you live, wherever that is, would you please work on admitting that there is abundance in your life? There's so much abundance around us. If you'll work hard, so much abundance. Secondly, appreciate. If you want to have an attitude of gratitude, recognize and admit There's incredible abundance around us if we'll take advantage of it and remain humble with it. To appreciate who makes your life better. Meaning, do you thank them? Are you one of the nine? Are you the one? Anybody in your life who has made your life better, would you for the rest of your life remember occasionally, regularly to thank them and continue to thank them? Appreciate the ones who make your life better. And some of the people who make your life better, they're not the ones that you necessarily feel a lot of love from. Pause and remember abundance also is tough love, is somebody who's willing to speak the truth to us. Those are people who really love us. Make sure we thank all the people who make our life life better. And third, acknowledge and enjoy life's small pleasures. God tells us to be faithful with the little in our lives, and then He'll give us more to be faithful with. So admit, appreciate, and acknowledge. I thought we'd pause for just a few seconds here, sit in silence, and watch some photos of what I think, and I think you will agree with me, what are the small pleasures in life that bring us joy and help us have an attitude of gratitude. Just watch these pictures. I couldn't help it. (laughs) There's nothing like a soft bed at night after a long day. Am I right? Isn't it funny the things that we grew up in were that were used against us to punish us? Go sit by yourself in quiet time. Go sit in your room. We long for those as we become adults. (laughs) Listen, you hold the power to decide what to put in your heart. You hold the power to decide what you're going to hold in your heart. It can be learned. You can make it a habit. The goal is to fill yourself with love and appreciation for the good things in our lives. This causes us to be in continual pursuit of the state and the attitude of gratitude. It's a continual habit that we should develop and work on. I want you to try something as you go about your day uh, throughout the rest of this week, maybe the rest of our lives. Make it a point to be grateful for the things that you may otherwise not even notice. As you're driving along saying, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Watch how it will affect every other area of your life. For instance... I love filtered water, especially the kind I filter through coffee grinds. I love coffee, and sometimes I take a moment in the morning, and I go sit out here, and I, I, I confess, I so would take advantage of our espresso machine in that coffee shop. I'm a spoiled kid inside that every morning, and I'll go sit out here on those orange couches, and I'll just say, oh, God, thank you for coffee, and I just have a moment with him. It's really a special, special moment. It's a little thing. 
So many little things can bring such joy and comfort into our lives. And as you and I begin to thank God for the seemingly small things in life, it'll help us to focus on the positive, the positive things that we need to appreciate but also do for others. So here's a challenge. Invite God into everything you do. Invite Jesus into everything you do. One of the best things we can do throughout the day is to praise Him while we work. You know the song, Whistle While You Work? Maybe it's worship while we work. Just giving Him thanks for everything. No matter what you're trying to build, your home, your marriage, your business, financial security, the list goes on. An exercise plan, you can worship God as you work. Don't go through the motions. Make a deliberate attempt and decision to be more grateful. Don't wait for the right time. The time's now. Elaborate. Be deliberate on why you are grateful. The importance of journaling. I encourage you sometime this week, get out a page of a journal and just write down everything you can think of. Take 30 minutes. Be still. Get a good cup of coffee. Sit and just write out the things you're grateful for. I want to read a passage that reminds us to do that. It's in the book of Philippians. Remember, the writer of Philippians is the Apostle Paul. He's chained into the bottom of a prison while he's writing this. And he writes what is nicknamed the book of joy. And he writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near, always. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, If there's any moral excellence, if there's any praise, dwell on these things. Dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul writes, and the God of peace will be with you. So one take home today. There's 18 days until Thanksgiving. 18 days. Starting today, starting this afternoon, I challenge you. Tell, show, write, Call, whatever is necessary, someone, one a day at least, that you are so very grateful for them. Be specific. 18 people will be blessed because of your gratitude. And maybe we'll start a movement of being more grateful in an American society where there's just a lot of anger and a lot of division because everybody's forgetting to be still to pause, and to be so grateful of the life of abundance that God has blessed us with and everybody with all around the world. Pray with me. We'll call the day. Lord, we love you. Thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for so many reasons to be grateful. Help us every moment, every day, think of the dozens and the dozens of things in that moment that we can be so grateful for. Thank you for a beautiful world that you have created for us to enjoy and to be inspired. Thank you for the amazing people all around us. May we be known as a group of people who have attitudes of gratitude. You are such a great God. We love you. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. See you soon.